just a two minute kind of explanation of Early Year Scotland. Early Year Scotland, um, we're a national third sector organisation specialist in the sense that we really do focus on our very youngest children. Um, and we tend to work with children usually to the end of P1 um, from baby and so on. So, that, so that's kind of our area of work and our purpose to support Scotland's youngest children. We do that in a variety of ways and their families to have the best start in life, to reduce the poverty related attainment gap. All of our staff are fully qualified early years practitioners and you can see there that our services direct, uh, we have a lot of services where we work directly with children and families in different kinds of concept contexts, but we also work very closely with the, with the sector across the board to support those who are working with, with children as well. So there are our four areas. I'm going to give the slides obviously over so you can look at these things and if you do want to find out any more, we can, you can perhaps um, you know, contact us. Um, one of the areas of work that we do with children directly is our suite of Stapley and Learn services and we do that in a variety of contexts with different children including you'll see there a P1 Stapley and Learn. We work currently in 26 primary schools with primary one through PEF and really that those sessions are around our practitioners going into schools regularly over the year and working with parents who come in for those sessions regularly to play the, the parents Stapley and Learn with their children basically. So obviously that's, that's us. We do have a direct connection with, with primary schools too. I've put up the practitioner forum remit just really to say that we have Jane and I and in our organisation we've been following closely what you're doing and what's being said and we're very clear about what your remit is and we're very, very welcoming of that, that this work is all happening around the standardised assessments. Um, wanted to, to sort of highlight that it's against the, pa the backdrop of a massive change in early learning and childcare where children are coming in and looking forward will be coming into primary one with in the main a much much more um, sort of lengthy experience of nursery or some form of early learning and childcare provision because I'm sure you're all aware that by 2020 but in many cases it's happening already children are being offered for the first time ever an unprecedented level of funded, government funded early learning and childcare. So it's more or less going to be the same kind of hours that children attend school, that all three and four year olds will be attending early learning and childcare because we expect that the uptake, whilst not mandatory, will be um, pretty extensive across three and four year old children and importantly, eligible two year olds, which could be around 27% of two year olds as well in uh, vulnerable circumstances. So I put that up just to um, highlight that we are also operating in a very different context going forward and that will have, obviously will have implications for primary one and what happens in primary one and children's learning and development when they arrive in school. So Early Year Scotland, to go straight to the, the heart of the matter, I thought just putting onto a slide what we feel, what we think and what we would love to have the opportunity to have more discussion around this. So we agree that there is a need to know where children are and their learning and development at national level in primary one. And the reason that I say at national level isn't because we think that, at all, that we want to have comparisons across schools or anything like that. It's simply that the poverty related attainment gap is national. And therefore, we think that there should be some kind of sense of knowing where we are in relation to that terrible poverty related attainment gap that we really must attack and tackle and reduce. We disagree with the current technological methodology being used for the SNSA. We absolutely concur with, with a lot of what you were saying, Andrea, around um, that kind of snapshot type of meaningless in many cases if you're only looking at a child being assessed often in a, an unnatural context and what that can bring forward in terms of being valid and reliable for being reflective of children's learning, we absolutely have no confidence there. We disagree that the current assessments are truly standardised and the reason that I say that is that we use this term, standardised assessments, what do we mean by being standard? Presumably the reference and the inference is that standard means equal and the same, but of course it can't possibly be when it's happening in one um, Sorry, I think my slides have just disappeared there. I don't know if you could possibly... I'll, I'll, I know that we're 
we're on film, so I'll keep talking. No, no, it's okay, Kelly. Um, so we know that, for example, children, are, it's not this, a level playing field for children. Obviously, when it's all technology dependent, and of course, children have all sorts of different experience, skills, uh, confidence around technology. And if it's all focused on that, that one experience that isn't part of the naturalistic learning uh, context and environment, then we don't um, believe that that can therefore give a very meaningful or reflective picture of the children's learning and skills. We welcome the new focus on play-based ped pedagogy in primary and very, very delighted really to see that that's much more um, being discussed and introduced and talked about. I think there's still a huge amount of um, a feeling around it not necessarily having the status that it ought to have in relation to uh, initial teacher training, for example, initial, initial teacher education. We do think that play-based pedagogy is much, much greater and much more critical and needs much more attention for it to be really meaningful and helpful and supportive for children, um, but delighted that that is happening. And I do, I'm a member of the Curriculum and Assessment Board in relation to early years in there, and we have been looking at play-based pedagogy at that level as well, which very happy about that. We do not believe that the SNSA in itself has to be wholly based on play-based learning because we know that children learn through play-based approaches but they also learn in lots of other ways as well. For example, through rich conversations and observations and imitations and all sorts of other ways too. That's not to take away from the importance of play but just to keep in mind that children do learn in lots of other ways too. Um, we do believe that we should explore and find better ways to measure at national level where children are in their learning and development at P1. However, we would welcome wider national debate about how this could be done effectively. And we do question the P1 starting point. We do question that in relation to looking at where children are at and waiting until that time. We think that, that in many ways, the children and the families we work with and that we know from evidence uh, based approaches and all sorts of other areas of research, including GUS, that already when children start school, that attainment gap is is way a yawning wide gap. So why why are we starting to see it's important to start looking at how far behind children are, especially our most disadvantaged children, once they reach five or once they start school. Earlier Scotland considers that going forward, critical ingredients of national assessment should include those main four points. Professional judgment has to be much more at the heart and that I can see Andrea concurs with a lot of what you were saying. But absolutely, why would we not? Why do we feel that we want to inform teachers through a kind of unnatural assessment, one off, one natural assessment? Why do we feel we want to tell teachers things they already know? And why are we not doing it the other way around and looking for that professional judgment that teachers would be able to tell us by observing and working with the children through um, much more everyday natural context? Why are parents nowhere? Why are parents nowhere on the scene when parents are so critical? And we know that again from much evidence. And children being ass assessed in their, in their natural in uh, way of working and learning and developing and socialising, why would we not want um, to know where children are at by actually looking at, um, at them in the way that they uh, operate in an everyday way? We talk about curriculum for excellence being very much about everyday learning, meaningful learning in everyday context. Why would we then all of a sudden remove all of that understanding and sense from... Uh, trying to find out where children are in their learning and development. And assessment is for learning appears to have kind of dropped off the edge for some strange reason, but I think uh, that assessment is for learning is a very, very sound approach and it doesn't appear to be featuring at all in relation to the current way of having that uh, nationalised assessment. So just a couple of slides to finish off. We know that I think in early years Scotland we really do want to really shout from the rooftops why is it that so much, including pupil equity funding and so many things start at this, at P1, why is that when we know how much has already happened way before that time? We know just a, a couple of examples here. 
at age five. I'm sure there's no one, no one here is surprised to see that because we do know this so much, but then we must take much more account of it, what's already happened there in relation to children at younger ages. Even by the age of three, we know that this um, cognitive ability tests that are done through GUS now, there you are, there's some assessments happening there at age three. Um, and that's not to say that we're looking for children to be assessed and we absolutely do not in any shape or form subscribe to formal learning for children f sitting in rows or learning or rote learning or anything along those lines for any children, any young children whatsoever. We do not see the need for any of that. However, that sits quite separately from knowing where children are in their learning and development. So I think a lot of it is about language. A lot of it is about language and also the appropriateness of what we are doing. Children uh, in their everyday learning and they're obviously learning from before they're, before they're born actually. We know that there's some evidence to say that and certainly from babyhood we know that learning is happening every day but we're not talking about formal learning. So why do, can we not take account of what's happening and be able to know what's required so that we can look to support children much better, especially those children who are in more disadvantaged circumstances. The home learning environment, again, language doesn't have to be called a home learning environment, but what happens for children out with the, either the nursery or the school setting, we know that's very, very impactful too. So we do, we would like to see a bit more account being taken of that and not just looking at what children are showing in a test, but actually a big focus on strategies and what we're doing in order to address what's happening. Um, so that's just some slides for your background information and I thought I would sneak in a wee cheeky slide there at the end just to advertise earlier Scotland's National Conference. We're, we're calling it in a kind of deliberately provocative way there is more to learning than play and that's not to undermine the role of play in learning but to just open up a debate and talk about what does learning look like, what does play look like, what is the relationship between play and learning because we are, we're quite anxious that we don't lose sight of the importance of learning as well in the early years and how much children learn through lots of different mediums including play. So. I think on that note, thank you very much everyone and I'm very happy to try to address any questions. Well, I've got one. <laughs> <laughs> I've got well, one of the things that you said that actually did make me think about, because I've actually started sort of thinking about what the report needs to look like. And one of the things that you said, which I haven't put in at all but actually was raised in previous meetings was the idea about what a standardised test actually means because there's standardised testing in the psychology sense of age standardised testing and um, but there's also standardised test in the men in, in or standardised assessment in the way that it's getting teachers all teachers across <coughs> Scotland to look at some of the same kinds of things and I think the word standardised is just used so loose. I can see Elspeth yeah. McCartney's, <laughs> Professor Elspeth <laughs> McCartney at the back <laughs> is just smiling at me. But the word standardised is used very, very loosely and it means a hundred different things yeah. to a hundred different people. Absolutely. I don't uh, know if you've got a view on... Yes, absolutely. I, I think that's right. I think we're, we're using the term standardised assessment and somehow that's, that infers that there's, there's equality and, and a, a level playing field. And of course there is in the sense that every child has to sit in front, uh, in this case, mm -hmm. every child has to sit down and they have to be in front of that computer and they have to, to, do the, to look at the same content. But why is that the necessary part that we're relating the word standardised to? Surely what we want to be standard is the opportunity and the fact that children are, are given an equal chance to be able to do that. And if we're already setting children up to be um, at different, different sort of um, levels of opportunity because some children, for example, will feel so much more comfortable with the technology, but also the whole idea that some children may well, for whatever reason, in that snapshot assessment, it may be that they're not uh, they're not confident, they're not well, they're not they're tired, they're hungry, they're you know that's not a, a kind of context that they feel comfortable um, in, and they don't want to to chat. So we're taking all of those um, you know messages from that child and saying somehow that's meant to reflect the child's 
learning ability skills and we know that that can't possibly be valid and reliable because we know how children learn, young children learn and develop and that would be the against all that we would say would be representative. Mm -hmm. If we really want to know then that's not a standard, it's not a standard that you're giving every child a chance. You don't see the, the, the idea that um, every looking at the same types of areas like comprehension, like um, call it what you like, decoding, um, as That's being something that uh, an assessment the child would sit would um, just raise questions that the teacher then has to investigate and think about and reflect on to come up with a professional judgment, which is the final that's that's the, that's the that's the final thing, which is informed by a whole load of things, not just the assessment. The, the yeah, absolutely. I could see that you could apply the term standard to that that element of it, but if then you're at odds with what you're starting with from your starting point, and you're not really looking to find, because we know we can't find what children know and can do and understand by using that kind of methodology mm -hmm. so there's no real point in the teachers all having that kind of standard element to their task mm -hmm. if the children are not then offered the same opportunity to show what they do know and can do mm -hmm. and, and it does prevent a curriculum becoming unhelpfully skewed mm -hmm. i think that there is a challenge things. I think there is a real challenge there in being able to then look at national level and say that there's some kind of standardisation. You can see this lady at the back is, going, is, is keen to say. It's a good point that's come up before in, in, in previous sessions. What you're saying is absolutely right. There is a lot of variation in yeah. how a child can perform an assessment, even if it's properly, properly mm -hmm. standardised. There's lots of variation in what people can do with the results. Mm -hmm. But many of these factors can be accommodated in that any assessment will not be 100% accurate and can say how accurate and inaccurate over a large number of, of pupils, how accurate and inaccurate it is. And one thing we've sort of agreed, I think, is that this particular assessment will publish a technical manual um, which would allow people to, to say, well, it depends very much how the child actually does the assessment. It does depend on age. You know, there's lots mm -hmm. of things that can be done. Yeah. So what Elspeth, Professor Elspeth McCartney from Stirling University, early years, <laughs> early years and a speech and language therapist, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is saying is that the technical manual will enable, will give um, professionals the information they need to know how, what, what, what the zone of reliability a particular um, yeah. assessment is, but we don't have that yet. Sorry, you were going to say something? I, um, I think maybe we need to change the focus that, that it, it's, it's, it's to correct our professional judgment because that's not how I would view it. I would say it, it helps me feed into my professional judgment. And I think that how you administer the assessment is can be very, very different. So not all of our children sat down in front of a, a laptop some chose PC, some chose laptop, some chose iPad, and some skipped around the room with a wand tapping at the big screen when they wanted to say yes, and that was fine. Some children sat at it for six minutes, and it took them over a period of two weeks to do because that was what they could manage with at that time. Other children were begging to stay on the computer because that's what they liked to do, and it all fitted into a very play-based curriculum where the children chose to come to that area. And I think there was maybe one child out of 40 children who had to be encouraged to come. And it wasn't come and sit and do this. They were encouraged by the other children because they were seeing the excitement of what you, by doing it. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I totally agree with your principle that um, we don't want to formally be assessing children all of the time for no reason. But I do think it does help us lead that play-based curriculum and allow us to move on from that so that children are not missing out. I'd hate to get to six or seven or eight and suddenly go, we don't know where the gaps in our children's learning are. And Absolutely. And all sorts of different ways, it's, but this is just yeah. one of the ways that can help yeah. us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do think that, um, of course, we want to know where children are and much, much earlier, uh, earlier the better, really, as long as the children aren't then in any way being compromised uh, in order for us to have that information. But we, when we were talking about it um, back at the ranch, we were um, alluding to things like the driving test, for example. So if you want to know if someone can drive, 
um, say let's say they can do they can reverse round a corner. I don't think you even do that now, do you? In driving <laughs> driving tests, I think they've stopped well, you doing have to that read now. Your sat nav while you're going along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if you really wanted to know if someone could reverse round the corner, and so you have say four people and they're all practicing in a mini, and then they come to to show and demonstrate their ability in reversing down the corner but all of a sudden you say well one of those folk you know you have to go into a juggernaut and you have to go into a bus and you can go in the mini but you're still saying that what happens thereafter during that test is somehow meant to be assessing how well you can go down the corner but you're removing the context you know so again we need to be mindful that that was a snapshot of the child at that time as it is the day that you play in the farm and can they tell you what the animals say in the farm that was a snapshot on that Mm -hmm. on that particular day and that's what we need to be mindful of but do you not think as a, that's why the professional judgment is so critical because Absolutely. you're not just you're not really getting a snapshot you can do it as well. mm -hmm. I think, you know, okay i'm going to stop it there because okay. we i'm keeping but jean is going to be around as well so that's yes, good thank you thank very you much very everyone much, thank you <laughs>